I'm, I'm curious, you mentioned the different flavors of mudita. And um, I think you mentioned it in the context of like your favorite flavor of mudita was like delighting in someone else's the gift of, of dhamma or something of that in that, uh, in that ilk, um, suggesting perhaps, you know, the maybe a worldly type of mudita where, um, you know, say someone, you know, gets a raise or uh, someone, you know, wins the lottery or something like this. And um, I'm curious, I, for a long time, even before I ordained, I had this question, like, what about worldly success, which seems like it's actually uh, detrimental to one's spiritual well-being? Like, what if I get a promotion at my job, but it actually means that, um, you know, I'm going to have to, uh, you know, I'll be able to spend less time in my Dhamma practice or, you know, even on a, a more worldly and less clear-cut way, you know, like say someone makes a joke, you know, a kind of a mean joke about someone and, uh, um, yeah, other people laugh. I mean, it doesn't really count as even a worldly pomoja in that sense, but I'm curious if you could talk about, um, yeah, what the, the other flavors of mudita aside from uh, dhammic mudita and how you kind of suss that out. Do you always delight in people's worldly success or are there areas of worldly accomplishment which seem like uh, they might actually compromise the dhamma and you don't really try to cultivate mudita in that, at that time? Yeah, that's a great thing to bring up. Thank you, Ajahn. I think mm, other people might have different opinions, but I think for me, wisdom is always necessary. So like you're saying, you have to see what the situation actually is before you just automatically sort of delight in somebody else's whatever it is going on. So mm, the feeling of joy might arise momentarily. And I think that can be mudita and there's nothing wrong with that. And then what you do with the actual situation later is what counts. <laughs> so like you're saying, if the promotion leads to less time to focus on your practice, then you have to have the wisdom to um, not let that happen or, you know, do something about it so that you stay on, on the tr right track for your, your own spiritual growth. But there's nothing, I don't think, wrong with the impulse of joy for someone else's success. Uh, the, the comment, the very interesting and I think pertinent comment about if somebody's laughing at someone who is not being kind to someone else, um, being able to recognize that would probably quash the mudita pretty quickly. And then you're like, oh, uh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> or mudita won't arise if you see this happening anyway to begin with. So yeah, it's good. Wisdom, mindfulness, the clear comprehension of what's going on. That so, makes a lot of sense to me that if you sort of perceive a negative action as it truly is as a, you know not beneficial for the person then that's not going to give rise to mudita based on that yeah. wisdom yeah um if others have questions type them in the chat either on youtube or zoom or raise your hand um and holly just rose her hand so hi holly <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me unmute Hello, Chitnanda. Nice to see you. Me too. Um, I've enjoyed Medita, but I have found I use it mostly uh, in the joy for the happiness of others. And I found that a good um, anecdote to when I'm feeling a little down or a little blue. If mm -hmm. I just can see somebody hiking and they're looking happy in the wilderness, just walking in the wilderness, and that lifts my heart up. Mm -hmm. So I found that as a good anecdote for depression so a little comment on that would be nice and then the other one is in when you speak of a mudita for oneself yeah i don't have the original sin baggage but i still find that kind of hard it feels like pumping myself up and i don't know it's just kind of i don't quite know what to do with that so those are my kind of questions thank you yeah thanks for asking um i yeah i enjoy brightening my mind with mudita too when I'm feeling kind of down so I think that's totally wholesome and a good idea <laughs> um 
as far as like your own having mudita for yourself being hard, you can just, for me, again, what helps is focusing on the right view aspect of it. It's like, this doesn't have to be an ego thing. And you can see clearly when the ego is arising around it and when it really is just joy because something good happened for anyone. And oh yeah, me too. <laughs> it's, it is right view. It's like, you do deserve this no matter what the world might be telling us original sin or not, you know, you did put in the causes and conditions for the goodness to arise. So don't, don't shortchange yourself. It's sometimes um, it might help to have a friend tell you <laughs> if you can't really be feeling it for yourself at the moment, talking with a spiritual friend who is going to help support you to grow the mudita for yourself and, and just tell you, Hey, you really do deserve that. That's great. I'm, I'm so happy for you. And sometimes that can help you feel the permission to feel the mudita for yourself. So that's my two cents. <laughs> Thank you, Aya. Um, switch over to a question from the text in here in Zoom. Uh -huh. This is from Jean Myers. This is Ajahn Kachana's mother. So Aww. another recipient of your, <laughs> of your beautiful cards. So yeah. the question is, how does mudita compare with gratitude? Mm. Yeah. I remember Jean. I met her a couple of times, I think. Yeah. Nice to hear from you again. <laughs> um, how does mudita compare with gratitude? I think gratitude can bring up mudita. Um, when you're when you're grateful for something, you're it, it's kind of like with generosity, you can be happy that somebody else has done this wholesome thing, and you feel the benefits of it, and they are gaining the benefits from it also. And hmm, it's an interesting one. I, I like the idea mudita and gratitude. Yeah. I'm not sure. Gratitude is more particularly from myself, I think. When I feel grateful, it's like a more personal thing, or even if it's grateful for something that benefits others, it's still I'm I'm feeling um, thankful and grateful for something. And Udita may or may not be a feeling of um, gratitude. If you're, if somebody else gets something good, you, you might not necessarily, necessarily feel grateful that they got it. You're just happy that they got it. Yeah. I'm not sure how else they might compare. If you, if the other two venerables have any ideas, I'd be happy to hear. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a really beautiful question. And, and, mm -hmm. um, I feel that, uh, gratitude, um, is, you know, you can even think of it as I've mentioned this before, and I think other people have had a similar reflection almost as a, like a fifth Brahma Vihara. You've got loving kindness, <laughs> you know, compassion, mudita, upeka, and then, and then gratitude is a, like a fifth Brahma Vihara, which kind of has for me a similar um, manifestation in that it's something which uh, one can bring to mind and have just kind of like floating in the background. It's almost like you know, on Zoom, you've got these filters in the background and like, you can almost like turn on the, you know, the red meta filter or the, you know, the green Karuna filter and um, kind of just like uh, imbue the mind or kind of like perfume the mind with these different, um, yeah, you called them flavors. They're almost like scent. It's like a, it's like a different mm -hmm. scent, which just like perfumes the air and, and gratitude um, has a similar kind of perfumey nature to it and um yeah so uh and, and a very similar feel for me um do you have any thoughts on that yeah i like the um the idea of a perfume being kind of i mean it's boundless in a sense you know mm -hmm. it does mix and sort of dissolve the usual distinctions we make and i think for me, that's the merger between mudita and, and gratitude is, um, you know, so many of the Brahma Viharas feel like breaking down those um, distinctions between self and other. Um, and there's a story of, of Kafka I really like where 
there was a little girl who lost her doll in a park and Kafka, Franz Kafka sort of found out. And the next day there was this doll left at the girl's door, um, or sorry, a note from the doll um, that Franz Kafka had written. And over the next few years, every you know, few weeks or months, he'd leave another note at the door um, from the doll in the different part of the world um, telling about her travels. And then the girl, when she graduated from high school, she went off to college. Um, but there was another doll that was slightly <laughs> different waiting there um, that she took with her. Um, and it was sort of her doll having come back. And years later, she found this note that had been hidden in the doll's hand um, that said, uh, you will lose everyone you love but the love will always come back to you in new forms. And that's relevant here, I think, because I think when you start to gain this appreciation of conditionality and realizing that all the goodness that we've gained and all these good qualities in a sense are gifts from others and also a gift that we have to give to others. And similarly, when we see like happiness or goodness in another person, so much of jealousy is, is seeing that as their possession as opposed to ours. But if there's this understanding that this goodness really does bridge relationship and, um, you know, then you see goodness or, or real wholesomeness in another person or, you know, success. And it, it's not being, you know, it, it's, it's impersonal. And so you can rejoice in it and there's no, you know, movement towards jealousy and gratitude feels like the same, like, when goodness comes to you, um, you, you don't sort of cling to it, but there's this immense sense of, it's the same impulse. You see goodness and there's gratitude for it because it exists in the world, regardless of whether it's yours or theirs or another person's, because all that sort of dissolves, you know, it's just goodness coming back to you in new forms. So yeah, I think they're very similar in a lot of senses. Mm. All right, so we're, we've got a number of different platforms, so if, uh, please everyone be patient. Uh, but let's go to Kim as a actual question uh, here on Zoom. Let me unmute you. Great. Hello, Aya. Um, I was just wondering if you could speak a little. Um, so I'm thinking of um, when you're using mudita as sort of an applied practice or a skillful means as an antidote to working with um, situations where jealousy is arising for you. Um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or advice on how to keep the, the sort of judging mind from creeping in. I, I find that when I'm working with mudita in that sort of applied way, there's this background of the judging mind um, that still wants to poke around at, you know, that I shouldn't have felt that arising of jealousy. Um, and so then I usually just switch to metta, which maybe that's the skillful means, but to be able to stay with the mudita um, without the aggravating the judging mind, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think as with most things, it's kind of important to work on what, work on what is arising. So uh, when the jealousy is arising, being with that internally and trying to um, see it clearly and understand what's happening and being with the sort of sense, the, the feeling of it and seeing the unwholesomeness of it to help sort of uproot it from yourself is, is very important. Sometimes trying to slap Medita on it as a Band-Aid um, is, is detrimental, really. Um, and if, if you've worked a little bit with the feeling of jealousy, having that arise, and you feel like you're in a place where it is a good idea to have uh, Medita bring up Medita, that's, that's good. And if not, it might not be um, effective. So kind of knowing yourself more, knowing when's the right time to use what is important. And like you said, maybe metta is the easier thing and it is a, a wholesome thing to bring up instead of mudita if you just can't 
sort of bring yourself to have mudita for the other person. Um, then maybe metta is easier, easier or upeka as well, equanimity as well might be a little bit easier. And yeah, if, if you can't have mudita for the person in that situation, when the jealousy is arising, maybe you can try to find something else about that person to have mudita for, some other aspect of good quality they might have or something else that doesn't bring up jealousy, but around the same person, that might help too. Um, does that help at all? <laughs> A little bit, okay. <laughs> I know Arjun Sona says if you can't spread metta to someone, spread it to their chair. So, <laughs> to their chair. Yeah. Um, as as you two were interacting with that question, it just brought to mind like a, you know, it's 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 easier to some extent to have mudita towards some people than than others, and similarly, like jealousy arises with certain classes of people more than others. And I think it's like a, I think there's a fair body of psychological or, you know, literature in modern psychology about, you know, we compare ourselves with people who are around our same demographic. So people who are around our same age, like plus or minus five years, um, people who are our same like socioeconomic status, you know, I'm not comparing myself with like five-year-olds. I'm not comparing myself with 60-year-olds <laughs> or like, you know, um, and in this comparing mind really has implications both on the jealousy aspect and um, with regards to mudita, it can be easier. You know, we're less as at the same time that we're less um, apt to be jealous of people who are very different from us seemingly in these external um, criteria. Um, it's, it can be easier to have mudita for like a little kid. He gets his ball. That's great. You know, it, or this, this old person, you know, they, you know, still have all their teeth or you know, something <laughs> like that. And you can delight in that. Um, so that might be like a good mm -hmm. practice ground, you know, for, for mudita. Like if we, if we find it difficult to have uh, mudita and we see a lot of, um, uh, yeah, jealousy coming up around people who are similar to us, then start with, you know, mm -hmm. someone who's quite different. Like it's easy, it's easy to wish the best for kids, you know, mm -hmm. um, especially if they're, well, yeah, if they're your own or if they're others, whatever's easier. And then just taking steps to increase the one's capacity for, for that. That reminds me of a, a skillful means about developing metas to imagine the person you're having trouble with um, as a, like holding their hand as a child and holding their hand on, on their deathbed and it's almost like the farther you get away from those, like the near comparisons and all the selfing that goes along, the closer you come to your shared humanity, you know, on either side of that age spectrum, mm. which, yeah, you're right. You don't compare yourself to five-year-olds very often. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's true. I don't, I don't <laughs> these days. Uh, I have got another question for you from, uh, this is from uh, YouTube. And again, people can put comments uh, in YouTube or here in Zoom. The question is uh, two parts. So Aya, I very much like that you made this connection between mudita and right view. Um, it's a very nice expansion um, of the idea of right view. So I think uh, there's, maybe if you could elaborate on this connection between right view and mudita. <laughs> nope. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think for me, it really is um, just seeing that causes and conditions bring about results. It's just karma. It's just natural that good things will happen to you and you can be happy about it because you know that you've been doing wholesome things, <laughs> saying, thinking, doing wholesome things, or other people have been also like the the raise didn't come because you were doing a bad job at work. You know, you, you were working hard and doing well, and now you have this result. So it's, to me, it's very like straightforward. I'm sure someone else could come up with a more elaborate um, expansion on that, <laughs> but 
<laughs> well, part of what you're saying, I mean, it, maybe it's, it's natural for you, but I mean, just you say like, you know, recognizing someone else's, you know, good deeds there. I mean, just in that, to be able to recognize what is, you know, kusala, what's a kusala, what is, what's wholesome and what's unwholesome. I mean, that is like part of right view and, um, yeah, that, that it doesn't come naturally for everybody being able to discern mm -hmm. that, that clearly. Um, mm -hmm. and, and also I am curious, um, you know, we speak about how it's so much easier to, you know, we, we, if meta gets easier for the people that are least like us, it seems like it would be hardest with the people who are like same age group, same, mm -hmm. I mean, I feel great meta for Ajahn Kobilo, but just to say <laughs> that, I think everyone who's lived in a community can relate to, you know, having to work with these sensations. So w what skillful means have you had for maintaining the Brahma Viharas towards those you've lived with? Any like little gems that have been the most helpful or, you know, what, what have you relied on in terms of your own practice, if I can ask? Yeah, um, I think in difficulty, I mostly go to Upeka. I mostly go to equanimity. Um, I lived at a monastery once as a Mahayana nun for a year, and there was this older nun who was there who ordained late in life. She was in her late 60s, I think, and she had just ordained a couple of years, um, fully ordained a couple of years before I moved in, and I was having a lot of trouble. Like, I think a lot of it was, was cultural, a lot of it was age, a lot of it was just personality, and a lot of incidents would happen <laughs> with sort of around those things and around um there's a lot of ageism in the community too it was a vietnamese community so there's a lot of that in the culture and i would go to trying to understand from their point of view and not take things personally um didn't work all the time of course <laughs> but that, that is what would help is, is having equanimity with seeing that none of this is self for any of us in the situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, kind of trying to be understanding and okay with it. So, mm -hmm. and then of course, living with Aya it's it's harder to practice because she's just kind of great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we have a very nice relationship and i haven't had too much practice <laughs> yeah. well let's go to allison thank you for your your patience um if you're still up for asking a question thank you I uh, thank you for introducing a new term for me, Pumoja. I, um, I have been practicing the four foundations of mindfulness using Dhamma categories as my meditation object. And um, there have been times when there's been this beautiful arising of seeing the interconnections of many Dhamma teachings and, and then feeling a sense of joy. And I, I didn't know there was a word for it. So that is so beautiful. Um, but I wanna ask along these lines, um, while I believe when calm arises and joy arises, I'm on the right track using Dhamma as, um, as a foundation for mindfulness, but I have also heard, I believe it was Ajahn Jeff who said that sometimes even when we take Dhamma subjects as our object, it can just become Dhamma, it can become idle chatter in our minds. And it kind of struck me that, uh-oh, I might actually be doing that. Um, because how do you tell the difference between the lovely rush of intellectual Oh, I love this from, um, maybe it's in the calmness, but from that, that beautiful um, samadhi 
calmness. I'm, I'm really getting somewhere here. So I'm just wondering, does the question make sense? Could you maybe elaborate a little? Because I feel like maybe I'm going off the mark a bit sometimes. Okay. Uh, thanks for the question. That's interesting. Do you, so to make sure I might be understanding you right, the question is how, really, how do you feel, tell the difference between the rush of like intellectual understanding about something, the joy and um, excitement sort of that comes with that and and what else like mm, maybe real insight so, or well I mean it, it can feel like oh I get it that feels like insight but is this really the pumoja that you're referring to oh. or am I getting a little lost here it's hard to say <laughs> I mean you, you kind of need to know for yourself in some ways um, I think when it really is insight there is a lot of pomoja and you kind of, uh, like it says in the suttas, you, you know it in the body, you know it with the body. So there's this real deep sense of, yeah, yeah, you're nodding. So I think you get it. <laughs> um, and there's also, when you get something intellectually, it, it doesn't, it feels uh, exciting sometimes in a way. There's like this, this exciting element that may be a little less um, peaceful or deep, <laughs> maybe, you know, it's like, oh, I get it, you know, and, and that, that's, that's Pomoja too, in a way, it doesn't have to be only from insight, the Pomoja, but um, the places I've seen it used in the suttas, Pomoja is like when there's like the transcendental chain of dependent origination where you you have like you, the seal is there and um, the, you see the suffering and then there's like, oh, there's the suffering <laughs> and you're happy that you see it like, oh, there's a way out, you know, and then there's there's one on like, I don't remember the name of the sutta, but it's something about wishing like a monk doesn't have to wish that this will happen because he's got good sila so he has no regrets and he he has pomoja because of it so it's like the pomoja can be from that too it doesn't have to be from inside it can be from seeing their own goodness it is kind of a mudita in a way but it's it's more than that or it's different than that a little bit yeah so i don't know that it matters so much if you apply the word pomoja to the, the deep insight or the intellectual understanding, either one is good. It's still a good cause for joy, <laughs> wholesome spiritual reason for joy. So I don't know. Did that help at all? <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Okay, great. I have a lot of mudita that things are going well for you. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> It's interesting, like this uh, mudita, you know, uh, mudita scale, basically. I mean, we've talked about it earlier this morning, you know, that you can just delight. I mean, this right now, question and answers where we've got, yeah, uh, some really good practicing people on the call right now. And we get to hear their thoughts and, um, yeah, discuss and have good relationship with Kalyana Mitta and specifically delighting in other people's responses and other people's questions and other people's answers. And that's one level of mudita um, or one level of karuna, depending, you know, and one level of metta, um, which is very, uh, you know, practicable in daily life. But then, yeah, it is, it is said that um, each of these four Brahma Viharas can be an object for specifically specific objects for deeper meditation, even up to the jhanas and can be provide what's called a liberation of mind, a temporary liberation of mind. And uh, yet for things that are on the edge of the mudita scale in terms of daily life, that's going to, yeah, you, you have to think when you're interacting with somebody, you've got to um, be thinking about what they say and, um, you know, analyzing things on a certain level. Um, but then when you take it into your sitting meditation, you really need to see what um, the mind needs. So uh, there's one way of 
that mudita can manifest as dhamma the first of the uh, seven enlightenment factors. But there's another way which mudita can manifest as piti, which is the third enlightenment factor. So um, yeah, you kind of balance things. Do you need, does the mind need to be um, kind of roused? Are you a bit drowsy? And if, if that's the case, you might want to be on the more um, speculative and thinking end of mudita. And then if the mind is, uh, yeah, already settled, then you can go into the, the more relaxed aspects of, of mudita and taking it more as, a, um, as an, an object of concentration. Any, any thoughts? Oh, that's good. Thank you, Allison. All right, uh, Madeline, would you be up for sharing? Hello, thank you. Um, I, I don't know if this is a question, but I kind of just um, wanted to uh, bring something into the conversation about Actually, it was uh, from when you were talking about children specifically and how it's easy for, easier for us to give um, experience mudita with children. And I, I was kind of thinking maybe that has something to do with our perceived innocence of them and a lack of judgment towards them. And so when I think about applying that to adults I feel like there is often a, a film of judgment in the way when experiencing mudita between adults and our own demographics um, the nature's examples are great like you see someone hiking and there's this joy um, I often go like bird watching in my neighborhood and I'm always like out there with the binoculars and um, like, I can sometimes see like people have this judgment, like, oh, maybe you're snooping with your binoculars. So they're not enjoying me, uh, like enjoying the hummingbirds. They're just, they have this film uh, that's covering that. So yeah, I was just thinking about the, the interaction between judgment and mudita, I guess, if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, don't let the judgment block the mudita, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't do it. <laughs> yeah, it does speak to like perception a lot, huh? Like we all have our filters, we all have our conditioning and and it's um, it clouds everything, it, it colors everything. And when we are not seeing clearly, <laughs> which is for some of us a lot of the time, because how can you see through something you don't even know you've got? in a way sometimes it's it's difficult so yeah um i like the the connection <laughs> yeah when we are in a judgmental space instead of a, a mudita space um it's just more suffering <laughs> judgment is just suffering and it's it's good like to be conscious of it when you can and of other people's too, it, it helps you have more um, compassion for them <laughs> when they're not feeling good, when they're having judgments about you. <laughs> that doesn't, it's not a nice, pleasant feeling to be judgmental. So yeah, I don't know. I well, think, thank you. <laughs> I think what you're saying in terms of the um, understanding about our own um, just how seeing someone's suffering can be, you know, maybe the reason we have so much, it's so much easier for us to feel mudita or loving kindness towards children is because we, their vulnerability and, you know, and, and pain, or at least vulnerability to pain is so apparent. And it seems like as people grow older, you know, um, we have this sort of delusion that people become more put together, but, you know, I, I like that metaphor of, um, you know, we, 
like a sort of wandering through a supermarket and then someone kind of bumps into you and knocks out, out all the groceries out of your hand and um, you're angry and then you turn around and find out they're blind and suddenly it's just like, oh, how, and the idea of the world is just, we're all kind of blindly wandering around bumping into each other actually, you know, and that the enlightened beings are the only ones who are really normal and sane and well. And it seems like if, you know, there's a lot to be, that access to loving kindness becomes so much more apparent when you begin to get a, yeah, a, a feel of that shared suffering and vulnerability, even as adults that we hide so well, you know, that it becomes a lot easier. And so, yeah, I, I think the idea of seeing your own and others' vulnerability is, you know, a, a route towards all these states seems really, you know, as indicated by when we look at children in that same way, seems appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, Madeline. Uh, let's see, Sophia. Hi. Um, good to see you, everybody. Um, I forgive me if I can't phrase this question <laughs> very well. I've been trying to figure out uh, the right phrasing, but um, I've noticed when um, so some say someone does something to hurt your feelings, um, especially someone you care about. Um, and you kind of want to, or it's easier to, when, when you know someone, especially to understand where these things come from. Um, you can say, oh, I see you hurt me in this way because I understand you have this such and such trauma or pain that you're coming from. And that can be a real way to sort of counter those negative feelings of, um, of pain because you can understand where it's coming from. Um, but sometimes that feels like, um, like an intellectual roundabout. Uh, and it can sometimes feel like, how do I honor my own hurt feelings and not skip over them? You know, how do I make sure that I don't just not feel my feelings and actually allow myself to feel pain, but, um, but also, you know, not wanting to hold resentment toward people and not, and knowing that holding on to the anger or the grudge ultimately hurts you in the long run. Um, so I guess my question is kind of, is there a strategy for using metta or mudita or something else to counter the negative feelings in a way that still honors your own pain um, in a way that, you know, can be used to hold people accountable without creating your own narratives about them? Because there's also the, oh, well, I know their trauma. And then you have a whole story about who that person is and what they're going through. And even if you're right about it, it doesn't release you from the um the pain dynamic so um yeah I guess that's kind of my question is how do you approach that yeah that's a great question and I'm so glad you're thinking like this this is great a lot of people do just kind of want to cover it over and it's not good hey random dog mm, just a little worried not too much okay sorry <laughs> um yeah so it's, it's similar to, hi, sorry. <laughs> um, it's similar to the, the question earlier about not wanting to sort of speak, like we call it spiritual bypassing. It's like, oh, it's just, you know, what you're describing. Yeah. And really being with the feeling of whatever that anger or pain is for yourself, um, feeling it in the body, letting it be there, being present with it, watching it change and go away and just taking the time to do that for yourself is important. And once you've kind of done that, to whatever extent you have done that, um, looking at it through the lens of like not self can be very helpful. That's what I usually end up doing is, you know that this person's pain has nothing to do with you. And you know that whatever they've said or done is not wholesome, it wasn't right on whatever level, you know, it wasn't a good thing to do for them. And that's their, their baggage and their karma. And for me, it's like me taking this personally is, it is delusion. Basically, it's not, it's not helpful for me, for my growth. It's not true. And it's, um, yeah, something that you should let go of and not, um, not in, like you're saying, not just sort of uh, brush it off kind of a way, but really seeing through this 
this sense of self that got hurt to begin with. It's like, it's not, it's not there, that self thing. What, what are they really hurting when they say or do these things? What is really being hurt here? And good luck finding it because the Buddha can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Sophia. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Tessa? That's great. Um, so I think, is it is it true, uh, Aya, that you have to leave at uh, 1.30? Is that accurate? Yeah, just about. Um, it can run over a little bit, but not very much. And seems like there's not too many questions left, yeah? We got a couple, I think. And I think they keep uh, trickling in. Um, hey, I'll let you know when I really got to run. <laughs> All right. Thank you. So we'll go to the chat. And uh, this is a question which is, not sure if we're supposed to be asking questions related to Mudita. If not, my question is, what is the best way to deal with or change harmful thoughts which seem uncontrollable? Mm. Yeah. Mm. I guess it would it might help to have a little more context. It depends on what the thoughts are. You might need to apply different things. Um, yeah, uh, trying to see through whatever thought it is might be good. It depends too. It, it's, it's helpful to try to get a little bit more settled mentally, do some meditation first, try to have a little calm <laughs> um, before trying to address it because otherwise it might just keep spinning. So if you can get a, a little bit of samadhi going, a little bit of settledness, or at least at least mindfulness around it, um, seeing through it. Yeah, context is important, but seeing through what's behind that thought, whether it's fear, fear can be a big driver of this a lot of the time. Um, fear, worry, resentment, I'm assuming it's unwholesome. Yeah, they said unwholesome things, harmful things. Yeah, <laughs> not obsessing like I have to have nibbana. Where's the nibbana? I gotta get that. No, that kind of thing. <laughs> but yeah, so looking at what's what's underlying the thought and kind of working with that will probably be your best hope. <laughs> yeah. If if there is more you'd like to say, whoever's asking the question, if they wanted to add more context, maybe it would help. And if, if not, maybe one of the other venerables can come up with something else. <laughs> Nick in the chat. Um, maybe just a quick, a couple really good, good suttas for this. Um, Maji Minakaya number 19 and 20, the two types of thought and um, the calming of distracted thought. And uh, the in that Maji number 20, the Buddha mentions five different ways to deal with distracting thoughts. Mm -hmm. And a really cool acronym for that is SLIDE. So you want to slide out of these uh, distracting thoughts by S, so you substitute. So if you have thoughts of, that you're saying they're harmful thoughts, thoughts of, yeah, uh, wanting to say something mean to somebody, you substitute that with a, a different thought. Like, why, why should I be angry at them uh, when they're just, they're just ignorant about a certain thing? You want to L, you can lull the mind into... Uh, a state of non non anger, basically just relax the mind. Uh, I you can ignore the thought, just be like, oh, just not going to pay attention. Come back to my meditation object. Come back to something more skillful. Uh, D you look at the drawbacks of that. If I was to keep thinking about how jerky this guy is, that would just you know lead to my own suffering and and their suffering. And then E you just this is like the sledgehammer approach where you just like expel the thought like like Thor basically. <laughs> um, <laughs> So great. Oh, I love the acronym, Ajahn. Thanks. That's good. <laughs> it's mostly Buddha. <laughs> well, I have not heard the acronym and I like it. <laughs> Do you have any thoughts? Uh, let's go for Beth. All right. Beth, uh, can you unmute and share your, your thoughts? Yeah. Um, yeah, I was um, 
what I've been noticing is, well, maybe this is a question. I think it's a question that I find that generosity, spontaneous generosity really leads, it like sparks mudita because there's this, there's this, it, it, this interaction with, with someone else, you know, it's this, and, and, and I find that it's different than sort of, um, I mean, we just come out of the season of giving gifts, right? And that feels very different to me. And it's not, ne you're not necessarily going to be making someone else happy by the gift that you give them. But I think that the spontaneous, the spontaneous outpouring of generosity that happens between people or between people and dogs or whatever is like, is this, it's almost like, um, I just feel like they're very connected. They're very, very interwoven with each other. Um, we give the gift of our time or we give the, or we see, or we see that's, that someone is needing help and we just spontaneously go and help them. Um, I, I read a story this morning about somebody who was having all kinds of mishaps and people were lending her their phone and giving her a ride and all of this stuff and how much, how beautiful that is, you know, how beautiful when we allow that to happen and we don't have um, a lot of fear around it. Um, so anyway, that's, those are my kind of random thoughts. I don't know if you have anything to add to that. <laughs> thank you for being here. Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's beautiful. I, I agree. I love that you get mudita for the giver and the receiver, you know, you have opportunity both ways. It's really nice. And it is one of my favorite ways to bring up Mudita too. And the recollection of it, it's like sometimes, oh, remember that thing happened five years ago? That was so great. It made me so happy. You know, somebody gave me something or I gave somebody else something or did, did a nice thing for someone. So yeah, it's great. We have some neighbors who, who got COVID over the holidays. They had a, a party for I think three, three or four different families in the neighborhood. And so our neighbors surrounding us all have COVID and we had extra soup so we could share. And that was nice. And yeah, it's just like when you want to be practicing mudita, bringing up all the things, the little things that happen, like the lady who got all this help, <laughs> bringing up those thoughts and, and sort of growing the feeling for yourself is nice. I know that um, uh, Ajahn Panyavado, I think, said that um, who I sent to Sika, who lives with you, gathered so many amazing interviews with, you know, said that a, a good measure of your progress on the path is, um, I think this was him or Ajahn Jayasara who said this was your sensitivity to the goodness you see in others. Um, and just, uh, yeah, it seems to ring with what you're saying. Uh, Beth, in terms of just the, you know, spontaneous, like that goodness being so apparent. And yeah, I think I was with a bunch of monks at Mop John and they showed one of those sort of Hallmark videos, like really cheesy. I've just never seen so many grown men cry all at once, <laughs> like while trying to look sort of restrained. It was pretty hilarious. So, <laughs> <Aww>. <laughs> but um, speaking of that mudita and sense of uh, rejoicing, um, well, first, Ajahn, do you have something you'd like to add on that one? Um, I appreciate everybody else's thought. What were you gonna? I, I was just gonna say I, I I do think you you probably do have to go. Um, can we ask you for any um, final words of encouragement for us up here, or uh, any <laughs> any final reflections on Mudita you can leave us with? Anything? Yeah. I, um. I do have a lot of mudita for the two of you right now. <laughs> Starting a new place is difficult, and I know it's coming from the right place from you. You really want to help everybody, and you want to have the Dhamma grow in the West and be available for people, so I really appreciate all of your work, um, and I know it's, it's, it's not easy, so happy to help in whatever way I'm able um, and I'm so happy to see such a, a very serious community. People are really interested in practice and working on themselves. And it sounds like it's going well. So I hope, I hope that continues. And I hope you have a nice rest of the day. Lots of mudita because you still have some day long left. 
<laughs> but gotta go because I assume she's gonna need to go share somebody to now too with her second online group of the day. <laughs> I, uh, um, thank you. And can we have um, for those lay people who are uh, or those in the gallery, um, can we have the community pay respects to you? Is that okay? Sure. Special request. <laughs> yeah, special request and a good one. Um, so if <laughs> those who wish to uh, pay respects, they can bow three times to uh, Aya and no pressure if you don't feel comfortable. <laughs> but, um, you can raise your hands and, and bow and say sadhu, 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 basically. So sadhu, sadhu. Sadhu Anumodami. My respects to the two of you also. Thank you very much. And my respects to the community too for all of their hard Dhamma work. It's good. It sounds really, I'm very encouraged to hear that people are doing well and they have good guides. So <laughs> thank you for having me. Have a good rest of your day long. <laughs> it's great having you. And I'm glad it still feels like you have mudita for us rather than compassion. <laughs> <laughs> Give, give us a year. <laughs> I can if you'd like. I mean, if that feels more appropriate to you. I'll come for that. No, Moody is good. Moody is good. Okay. <laughs> we'll take the sympathetic okay. joy. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Bye. So we can continue with the Q and A uh, and discussion for uh, maybe another twenty-five minutes or so, if people wish. Um, but we're really grateful to have gotten. Aya here, she's uh, really wonderful. And we'll have Aya Santusika joining us tomorrow. All right, let's uh, jump to Charles. Charles, it's good to see you. Would you um, unmute and share your... I, I told Charles we were canceling the day long in person when he was about a quarter of the way up here from Portland. So Charles made was... a great sacrifice. <laughs> I was northbound on I-5 and I stopped just before they closed the freeway because of flooding. So <laughs> good timing. <laughs> Thank you. Well, it's good to see you and um, lovely to say hello to you all from um, sunny Portland, go figure. Um, so maybe my question is sort of indirectly related to Medita, uh, perhaps considering uh, Meta Bhavana as sort of the entry point to the Brahma Viharas. Uh, and maybe a bit of a practical question. Uh, several times, uh, <clears throat> both from you this morning and uh, previously from Ajahn Jeff, I've been encouraged to start meditation period with uh, practices of metta. And um, there are times when I can make a little bit of traction with that, but oftentimes it's as if my mind has stepped on some ice and it flies off to some other place, you know, some reactive negative rabbit hole. And um, it's really quite a striking reaction, you know. If I start with me, like, what do you want? You know, what are you, what are you doing this for? Joy, freedom. I can sort of hover in that for a moment. <clears throat> and then the mind is off in some place that's just really not so good. I just find that consistently is the case. And what I've found so far is that if I go to tranquilizing bodily fabrications by directing the breath in certain ways, that's kind of... I do that for 20 or 30 minutes, I get settled down. But I'm, I'm interested in input and feedback on how to handle the mind around metabhavana when the mind is kind of like just, just not having it. I like bringing up the direction to start meditation with the metta just because it you know it is what my teacher Ajahnanan said and it um it emphasizes the importance of the practice um however I also find that you know frequently it's not where my mind actually wants to go right off the bat in meditation and um metta in general is uh you know, like, like I said, I think frequently, you know, it is this beautiful flower, um, sort of, which does rise of its own accord, but so often we neglect the either just acknowledging what's going on. Um, and sometimes that really does require us to just sit in quiet for a while and sort of see what echoes of the day are kind of running around in the body. Um, and this is, I think, really the importance of 
uh, breath meditation and, and learning to cultivate a broad awareness of the body is you learn to kind of drop awareness from the head into the torso, really consciously learning to body scan a bit or use a bit of qigong or cold shower or exercise or something to make awareness drop from the, the head. Um, and that, you know, until you've done that, then so much of the metta is just more vitaka vichara, um, more kind of restless running around of the mind, ways to really access that kind of deep um, caring uh, sense of metta. It does, you do have to have access to the body. So I also find initially beginning with grounding in the body and a body-based practice um, can be really helpful. Um, and the second is, uh, you know, and so that could be compared to, once again to the soil that you're planting that flower of metta in, um, but that you do need to sort of plant it in the body and in any kind of, you know, the suffering that you might be going through at that time or your own experience really, and just letting that ring for a while. Um, and, and the body also could be looked at as the trellis a bit, I suppose, in terms of, um, you know, coming into awareness of the body or your other, other meditation object. And um, yeah, I, I find sometimes going straight into metta doesn't work for me either. And sometimes you really have to kind of expand awareness and dissipate some of that energy first. Um, and, you know, the final thing just being that uh, I do think one place it is really helpful to apply that first, the first order of business is metta is, is waking up. Mm. Um, so usually when you wake up, it, you know, Ajahn Viradhamma recommends before you even move, just lay in bed for two minutes and bring awareness to the heart area and just get that warm glow going. Because right when you wake up, you'll notice the self is trying to crystallize around something and the defilements and the argument or greed or aversion are the easiest things for it to crystallize around. So if you right when you wake up, make sure that yourself crystallizes around loving kindness, it pays huge dividends through the day and I, and your mind is very malleable. So yeah, Charles, I, I think if, if your mind is going towards the body at first or a different meditation, that's fine. Tag on, you know, put a met at the end. Um, but I would say waking up, it's very much worth trying to bring it right away if one can. Does that, um, Ajahn Kobilo? Just a little bit of a addenda to that is uh, just reiterating the importance of being in the body, but also something which I know you, um, Charles, which you're pretty aware of is just like the importance of uh, psychological mental flexibility and so not, um, yeah, not being rigid in the way that we think. And one aspect of mudita, which we haven't actually touched on, is the, the etymology of mudita itself. I mean, mudita uh, comes from the word mud or mudu, which literally means soft. So this word comes up in a number of contexts. Um, in the, the commentaries, uh, the, uh, these... Um, commentators talk about the importance for when you're developing samadhi, you're developing concentration, you need to have both flexibility and softness, both of body. So mudu kaya, mudu kaya, you want your body to be soft and malleable and flexible and soft. And you want uh, psychological non-rigidity. You want uh, chitta mudu. You want your mind to be able to um, get into this, this space of being flexible and uh yeah just as in the beginning we mentioned that you can take metta as a as a, a mantra even met on the in breath ta on the out breath you can do that with any of the brahma viharas really you can do it with any word um i think it was holly earlier but talking about using different dhamma concepts as uh your framework for was it, it was allison okay um but yeah you can use you know, any concept as a, a mantra, but especially even this mudita, mudit, ta, mudit, ta. And it doesn't have to be poly, of course, just soft, 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 soft. Especially when the mind is getting more rigid, 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 rigid. You just want to get more soft, 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 soft. Okay, just soft, just soften, just soften everything. 
Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that's, that's really important. And you can start with the body. Like even if the mind is ready to fight and ready to uh, just, you know, jump out of your throat, um, still relax the shoulders, relax the face, relax the, the head, relax the hands and relax the heart. And then the heart and mind can, can follow in suit. And that really goes a long way to, uh, to deal with psychological rigidity, which is the base of many of our problems. I, I think that's really good, Ajahn. And, and I, I think a good, like to supplement what Ajahn's saying a bit around um, this, the whole concept of kind of spreading or doing a mantra um, has a certain rigidity and intention around it. And I think it's good to remember that metta, you know, a lot of teachers point to the fact that awareness itself is imbued with metta in that real broad awareness can hold everything within it and accept it. And that is a quality of metta. And sometimes that kind of soft metta or, you know, Long Prasumedo uses this as a synonym for patient endurance, but I think it kind of applies to metta too, just peaceful coexistence with the unwished for. And sometimes that quality of metta, just awareness of what your experience is, which might be the body, but not sort of this active, you know, activity, but just a softening around and holding um, what your experience is like, that is a form of metta. It's just a gentle one. Yeah. Yeah, really good point. I learned this recently. I don't know if you've heard this, but uh, according to the Abhidhamma, every wholesome mind state is accompanied by one of the four Brahma Viharas. So anytime mm. you have a moment of mindfulness, anytime you have a moment of, of, of wanting to be, to be generous or keep precepts, uh, there is part of that mind state, according to Abhidhamma, mm -hmm. the kind of Buddhist psychology, um, ancient Buddhist psychology. It, it reminds me of the metaphor you're using about light and warmth. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. wherever there is that light of awareness, it's mm -hmm. going to get warm mm -hmm. too. Like they're, they're kind of inseparable, the two qualities of metta and awareness. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think sometimes leaning on the awareness side is probably, but the warmth is there, you know. Right, right. Mm -hmm. You don't always need the radiator. Yeah, the radiator. <laughs> Um, let's see, actually, uh, yeah, we're gonna, um, since we just did the actual question, uh, Charles, let's go to Dennis's question. Um, when I am, this is in the chat box, when I am working with a difficult person or persons, it helps me to remember them as a five-year-old and they are likely manifesting unhealed hurts from long before, long ago. Do you have any reflections on that? Yeah, I mean, I think that's definitely what we were pointing to with, you know, the Buddha has a, uh, it's, it's part of the beauty of the first noble truth is it's not just your own suffering, but the Buddha has a sutta where he says that meet, uh, feeling is the meeting place of all, like feeling is the meeting place and dukkha, suffering is feeling. And we all meet there in a sense. Um, so if you can trace every neurosis, every problematic person back to the initiating wound, you know, their wound during childhood or what they're doing at home, you know, what's going on at home. Um, you know, we all have that experience of seeing that side of someone and just being like, oh, of course, of course they're like this right now. So yeah, you know, that five-year-old is behind everyone, including you. And in some sense, we're all just kind of five-year-olds dressed up kind of, you know, in, our, in adult clothes wandering around. So yeah, I think that's very skillful and completely right view as well. So Ajahn, do you have anything on that? Hey, Mary's question first. Yeah, yeah. Can let's... Um, Mary, I'm asking you to unmute. Go for it. Hi. Hi. So nice to be with you. And I want to thank you for giving this retreat under the circumstances. Most grateful. It's quite wonderful. Great to see you, um, Mary. Mary was my first Dhamma teacher, or one of them. <laughs> yeah, one of them. Um, it's taken us both a good ways. <laughs> um, my question, actually, Kovalo, I wanted to um, explore a little bit more about what you said around Karuna. I have always seen Karuna compassion as an action. And my understanding had always been that the action would be 
towards another. So you see a cut finger, you put a Band-Aid on. But the similes suggested that the first action is an internal one to take care of one's mind, to keep it in an open spot um, that can respond appropriately. So I'm interested in your thoughts in that. And also my second part of this is that I've always, the connections between all these things are so beautiful. I have always seen keeping the mind in a mm, beneficial state is part of right act, effort. Mm. And so I appreciate your comments on both of that. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, yeah, you bring up a really, really good point. I think that's um, a lot of people's understanding of compassion. I mean, you've been uh, involved in you know, Buddhist thought and Buddhist study for a long, long time. Um, but I mean, I mean, the, you know, the Christian or even Western concept of compassion is really like a, um, an outward going one. And, um, also in Mahayana, that's in Mahayana Buddhism in, in China, uh, Japan, uh, Vietnam, Tibet, it is, it is very much seen as, um, like an active, uh, it's, it's basically, seen as like the hands of metta. So when metta mm. goes out into the world to okay. relieve suffering, that is compassion, that is karuna. Um, and I think that's very true and very beautiful and something which um, I think is really important for people to uh, examine within themselves, like their capacity for that and inclination or non-inclination to, to try to you know, take things into the world and actually put, put that Band-Aid on um, I have been reading recently, there's a, a wonderful book called Compassion and Emptiness by Bonte Analio, where he really goes and examines um, pretty much, it almost seems exhaustive, look at where the words karuna and uh, um, but, yeah, sunyata for emptiness, but karuna and anukampam mm -hmm. is another word which means to tremble with, or it means to have compassion for, and he looks at every instance in the Pali Canon and makes, you know, a, a case that in, um, in Theravada Buddhism, as it manifests and as it presents itself in the Pali Canon, it really is much more this, this mental turning in the direction of may, may there be relief from suffering. And it is, it is external, um, largely, but it's also internal. May, may I be free from suffering and may they be free from suffering and doesn't, um, certainly doesn't necessitate putting the Band-Aid on. It's, <laughs> it's uh, largely this initial just, uh, you know, may they be free from the suffering of the, of the wound and mm -hmm. the actual taking of the next step to put the Band-Aid on is over and, and above that and is a good thing, of course, if you can do it. But um, yeah. what, are, what are your thoughts? From this book? I really like that I hadn't, heard that the quality of trembling with it makes sense i mean you're you're echoing someone else's trembling but that it's so transpersonal mm. you know it's just the wish for suffering to be alleviated and mm. it makes sense because yeah when you touch suffering it, it is the meeting place and there's self and other really do dissolve there i mean it's you know maybe the buddha established nibbana as the pinnacle at which we all meet and aim but it's almost echoed by this reference point equally below um, of suffering where we all meet at the same time and somehow mm -hmm. seeing one equals coming together on the other as well and both transcend the personal. So that, that's really interesting. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think, you know, Mary, I, I think what you're pointing to about, and, and Ajahn, about compassion is not just an action, um, but a way of preparing the mind is, is very relevant in a practical sense, because I think a trap with so many of these Brahma Viharas is how we try to spread them and send it out and help others in, um, or, or, you know, sort of shoot meta rays in a really, you know, uh, kind of over the top way of saying it. Um, but 
you know, long Papasano really points to, um, I just read something by him recently where he says like, it's much more about deepening the vessel of the heart and the body, filling it with this warmth, like Ajahn Kovilo was bringing up and then making it wide enough to hold more and more of the world. And practically that manifests as instead of imagining sending metta to people, which dissipates that field, um, he recommends shrinking them and, and bringing it, them into the heart. And I know I've mentioned this before, but it really works very well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's good. Like until the metta is very strong, um, not looking at it as this action of hands going out and energy shooting out, but rather you're preparing the ground and bringing people in and realizing that, that the world exists here already. And, and just in a very practical, somatic, practical sense, that's very helpful. And, and also to say that in terms of our lives, I mean, so often metta and compassion manifest in these external images of, you know, you have to go have a career helping children in X, Y, and Z, or, you know, the, the classic infomercials asking for donations. And those, all those are very good causes. But just to say that, you know, Jung said that we miss God because we don't look low enough. And <laughs> so often within our lives, there's so much opportunity for that loving kindness to manifest right here in terms of like, you know, folding, you know, making the bed of your loved one or, you know, doing the dishes extra well for them and then bringing them some tea. Like we don't actually have to go out as this huge action to metta. It's right here. If we just prepare the ground carefully. Um, so, I, I mean, it's not quite where you're getting at, but I think it's actually there is this no. seductive, you know, drive to like make it this gigantic action. And Ajahn Amaro frequently references the screw tape letters, which is a great C.S. Lewis book about this demon giving advice to his demon nephew. And he references this one lady who, what did he say? She, um, she loves to help people and the helped have the look of the hunted. And I think, you know, we have, so we know people like that who like, they have to help you. <laughs> and, um, and sometimes it's good to know that, you know, Metta can just be preparing the ground right here in our own meditations and somatic fields and our lives very carefully, I think. I that helps. It, it almost seems like we have to do that before we could find appropriate action. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both. Mary. It's like you're stockpiling band-aids in your left <laughs> ventricle. And in your <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got two more questions. We've got five minutes. Sure, okay. um, so one question is from Adam. I find when I'm meditating, it is easy to feel the glow, in quotes, of mudita or karuna or metta. But when I'm amidst the noise of daily life, it can be hard to access compassion or joy. So I feel like I am, quote, faking it if I try to vocalize compassion or joy to someone with whom I am feeling upset, frustrated, annoyed. Is it better to step away during these instances? Is this a time to use slide? Um, yeah, I, I think there's a place for faking it till you make it. And I think you need to be, it, it, you know, you can be compassionate with yourself that, uh, um, yeah, we're not as proficient. We, we never have as much, uh, meta, you know, as we might, we might like some of us and, um, yeah, you know, faking it till you make it, you know, has got a bad rap. Um, you know, if, if I can at least not, uh, yeah, if I cannot say that mean thing to somebody, it might seem like I'm, you know, uh, you know, doing like the meta spread of like spreading it in the sense of like, you know, cold butter on bread. Um, but uh, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be like that. Um, um, yeah, I mean, sliding. So again, just a quick run through of that acronym. It's, uh, this is sub. Uh, ways to inter counteract unwholesome thoughts. You substitute, you lull, you ignore, you look at the drawbacks and you just uh, execute or you uh, right. eliminate and expel oh. all of these ease. Um, and 
yeah, you really, yeah, do what you can and experiment. It's things really aren't cookie cutter um, uh, when it comes to, to daily life. You're kind of making the, you're making the cookies as you go, so. And, and there's a difference between suppression and repression. You know, like we're not for repression, like you need repressions where you don't acknowledge that you have a feeling. Like it's good to acknowledge that these feelings are coming up even if we rather not have them. Um, and suppression means you don't act them out and you don't buy into them or approach them with craving or grasp them. Like, yes, they're there, but you don't have to speak from it. And, you know, a lot of times just, um, that's that's good and and then yeah faking it uh in the you know as long as it's not terribly you know over the top or something is yeah just being good to people and acting like an enlightened being would as much as you can um while not being completely disingenuous and any you know you do have to figure out that line it's you're making the cookies as you go but yeah yeah making the cookies as you fall out of the plane as you fall out of the plane yeah. with the left ventricle yeah band-aids yeah Okay, final question. Um, thank you for being here today. This is from Karina. Can you elaborate on how to apply any of the Brahma Viharas when you are in a situation when someone belittles you? I think this really comes to the importance of conceiving the Brahma Viharas less as this overt action of, um, you know, always and sometimes is just a holding in awareness of suffering and um, feeling that and being willing to and, and that compassion, because these are naturally qualities of the heart they don't need to be revved up all the time. Sometimes it's enough just to feel pain openly and, and look at it with wisdom and, and, and that from there, you really can move to a very natural sense of compassion and care for yourself and others. And also that the, to remember that the Brahma Viharas so often do begin with the focus on one's own well-being and state and so which all is all to point to the first noble truth again and again like coming back to your own stress suffering imperfection disappointment sometimes at the very beginning is is important so when you're being belittled i think you know frequently the reaction is like oh i'm just going to feel meta towards this person or something and just to realize that in those situations, it may just be enough to feel your own pain at that. I mean, it's really brutal. Um, we want so badly to be loved and we work so hard to be good. And then when someone doesn't see that, I mean, it, it really does hurt. And to see our own attachment and craving and, and just acknowledge that before we move on from into the other stages of more active met. I think just first stopping there and kind of having compassion for oneself. And I think that goes for, you know, when one is angry too, you know, so often the reaction to feeling angry towards another person is to try to blanket over that feeling with, with metta, paint over it with that sort of graffiti you were talking about. And um, frequently you just have to feel how much it hurts to be angry yourself, like, and where that anger is coming from. Cause usually it comes from your own sense of wounding. Um, so, Time and again, I really find coming back to the initiating wound before you move on, even if you don't want to dwell there or wallow, but just we tend to pass over that part, which is why the Buddha really plants a flag in it as the first noble truth. So just, you know, we want to jump straight to the fourth noble truth of like develop, you know, cultivate, stop first and comprehend. That's the first noble truth's task, comprehend suffering, just stop feel your own pain in all these states. And then if, if it's light, if you can move on naturally, great, you know, actively develop that bright loving kindness. But frequently you'll find you just need to hold yourself a little bit, you know, and, and that there's a place for that, I think. So I think that goes for being belittled, for feeling angry, for feeling greedy. Um, yeah, things, we're quite sick 
it's uh, it's good to remember that. Okay. Yeah. Just good, good reflections and good questions, everybody. This is uh, I really appreciated uh, reading people's questions and um, yeah, I think we'll shift into our next period.